Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Legacy, which is episode 6 of season 4 of Star Trek Next Generation. This video is a part of a series of videos uh, where I review episodes of Star Trek Next Generation one episode at a time. In this video, I cover the fourth season episode, Legacy. So Legacy is the episode where a Federation shuttlecraft crashes on a hostile style colony the same one that Tasha Yar was from and so they try to uh, rescue the um, survivors who are now being held hostage so they team up with one of the factions to try to get uh, the survivors back however this faction sends a shower yar who is tasha's sister who at first speaks very ill of tasha for leaving the planet but she helps uh the crew uh, try to rescue the uh shuttlecraft survivors and she starts to bond with the crew in even going as far as saying that she wants to join starfleet however this turns out to be a deception as uh riker and their way team do in fact rescue the shuttlecraft survivors Survivors. However, a shower yard takes it advantage of the situation to try to wipe out uh, her adversaries once and for all by allowing an army of her people to invade. However, uh, Data and Riker stop her from doing so, and Data feels very betrayed by this as he had trusted her, but she insists that she did in fact care about him, and that wasn't a lie. So, um, first of all, let me get this out of the way. The episode is mainly called Legacy um, because it is the eighth, 80th episode of Next Generation, which means that Next Generation has surpassed the original series for <coughs> episodes. Now, that, if, in fact, is only if you don't count the cage as an episode. Because if you do, it won't be till next <laughs> week's episode. But obviously, they're not counting the cage. Because it's not really an episode that wasn't aired with all the original series. And they, you know, just showed it through the menagerie, which counts. So, yeah. Anyway, that's semantics. Doesn't matter. Point is, they made a huge deal out of this. Because Next Generation was always seen as the best child of the original series always trying to be better than the original series but always will be lesser and I remember those days even back in the uh, early 90s when after it got really popular still by many Star Trek fans seen as lesser something I always would fight back against and it wasn't until like I would say years later that Next Generation was held in just as high esteem by many more higher than the uh, original series but at the time it wasn't so i understand this was a really huge deal uh in fact later they would go to you know gene roddenberry showed up on set and they like cut a cake or whatever but that was actually in the hundredth episode um, Redemption, which I guess I'll probably talk, but that will be a revisited because I already covered Redemption. <laughs> but I'll, I, you know, I'll talk about that more when I revisit Redemption. But yeah, that is huge ceremony, um, and part of it was the fact that it surpassed the original series. And also, Roddenberry said that you know, season four was the best, like. <clears throat> season of Next Generation that didn't have the untroubled, I think he said. And I didn't realize this at the time, but he was referring to all the chaos and commotion that was behind seasons one and two. And even season three was a bit chaotic because they were rushing to get scripts done. And from what I've heard from Michael Piller and Ronald D. Moore and other people involved, that the fourth season was. Uh, a lot more smooth and it was the first really smooth season of Next Generation that wasn't all chaotic behind the scenes. Um, but for that reason, they thought that season four was better than season three and that's something I disagree with, partly because we have medi mediocre episodes like this one. Now, <laughs> now the other uh, thing to note about this episode is that uh, this is the first episode written by, or that at least has the right, written by credit uh, for Joe Manowski. Now, I talked about him previously because he did join the writing staff 
of uh, Next Generation at the start of season four, and you see he is uh, credited as the story editor for uh, pretty much all the episodes of season four, including the previous ones, but this is the first one where he has a written by credit. And you know, I've been, I was going through Joe Minoski's um, catalog of all the episodes that he wrote, or at least the ones he has a written by credit for or story by credit for um and i've come to the conclusion that i'm not a huge fan of joe Manowski. um i've already talked about how i was very sour towards him because he wrote the dark frontier episode over in voyager which i think is horrendous and he defended it by saying i don't give a shit about canon well that's pretty obvious and i think that's disrespectful and bad writing more than being disrespectful i think it's terrible writing you come into an established franchise you're benefiting off of all the work everyone has done before so it is disrespectful to completely ignore and write and plus i think retconning is the laziest thing writers can do uh, to me retconning unless it should be done there are some cases of good retcons that should be done but unless that is the case then retconning is the worst like laziest type of writing there is but you know i would try to be fair to him so i was looking up his um you know his um list of all the episodes he wrote and most of them are either mediocre or bad i gotta be honest that's not to say he's never written any great episodes that i love he co-wrote year of hell with uh brennan braga which is my favorite episode of voyager uh and there's uh he wrote darmok which is Maybe it's a tad bit overrated, but still a really good episode. Um, and so, yeah, he's he's not a terrible writer, I would say, but I don't really like his style. Um, like, some people say, oh, I like his style. You can tell this is Joe Minoski's script because it has a strong character story. Where I think Rene Ecrevera is actually much better as far as writing characters go, and maybe also Jerry Taylor. I don't know. There's something about his style, and the you know, the, I sorry, I will always hold it against him of him, him saying he doesn't care about canon. I think that makes him a shit writer just for saying that. But regardless of that, there's something about his style that I'm not that big of a fan of, and I think this episode would fall into the category of his mediocre episodes like i can see the semblance of a good episode here but i don't know it, it's never terrible like it doesn't fumble it doesn't have like these moments like oh that's terrible but it never gets there if you know what i'm saying now this is a Again, this will be a common theme and during Season 4, and I'm going to mention this over and over again, so I do apologize for people who might be sick of hearing me say this, but I think it's relevant, and I do need to bring it up. The fact that I Season 4 was the first season that I saw, and I keep seeing, and it's the episodes I've seen the most. So it's harder for me to judge these episodes through the lens of being so sick of them, of seeing them so many times. And... This episode, I had to step back, and I think it's been, other than my season-by-season season review I did a couple years ago, it's been a while since I actually saw this episode. And um, so I, I try to leave aside the being overly sick of it and try to judge it as if I'm watching it for the first time, which is hard to do. But <laughs> trying to do that, I do see this episode does have some merits, it does have some good points, but as far as an episode that honors the legacy, let's see what I did there, the, <laughs> that honors the legacy of Tasha Yar, well, this episode doesn't hold a candle to <laughs> yesterday's Enterprise, and it kind of seems like a vague shadow after, because why do you need to have an episode that pays homage to Tasha Yar when yesterday's Enterprise already exists? But regardless, um, it was a somewhat interesting episode. I think the concept of Tasha having a sister who didn't see eye to eye about her on this world, in fact, was all in on the you know my cadres and and her companions and, and were like all in on the infighting and totally bought into the um, concept of it. it. Was interesting, but more than that, I think it's interesting visiting a f the concept of a failed colony 
um, that humanity tried to set up this colony, but it like fell into disarray and, and total anarchy. Which, by the way, this is the you know, libertarian type of type of anarchy, <laughs> the Mad Max type of anarchy, um, which there is a difference. But I'm not going to get into it. But there is. But anyway, this is clearly that. To me, it made me think of these libertarian paradises that people try to set up or imagine, but they would really fall into this type of chaos. Um, but yeah, the, having that concept is, is very interesting. Um, and that didn't make me think, because that concept was originally thought up uh, as Tasha Yar's backstory. And this is what I've been saying about next generation season one as some people try to say that's the worst season of the franchise which i disagree with i think um i think picard season two is easily the worst <laughs> season of the franchise but even beyond that the first two seasons of enterprise are worse uh and i think season two of next generation is slightly worse than season one and the reason why and why I think it's relevant here is because the fact that they came up with these rich backstories for these characters. Now, granted, Tasha, they didn't do dust justice to, and they didn't really explore her until after she died. But they had really thought through these characters that they created, and they created a very interesting cast of characters. So even though most of the scripts throughout season one and two were terrible and and were poorly written and there was a lot of chaos behind the scenes it had a strong basis like it had a strong bible as they call it of and it came up with really interesting characters and that is why i say next generation is better specifically why it's better than the first two seasons of enterprise because they failed to do that their cast of characters are bland and uninteresting and so that's the main difference between tng and enterprise that's what makes the first two seasons of tng better than the first two seasons of enterprise but anyway I just thought of it because this concept of this failed colony wasn't thought up of in this episode it was thought up of as the backstory of tasha Yara, which just proved to me that these characters were really well fleshed out and thought through but anyway so i find it interesting to explore that that colony that they went there and that they explored the backstory of the colony uh, of this, you know, failed colony that went into other chaos, a human colony, because you always think of humanity as being in this paradise in the Federation, some perfect future, and the fact that Roddenberry approved that there was this colony that completely fell apart and failed, and it was an example of humanity failing. I think I'm surprised he would do that, but that's actually really impressive. I think that's really interesting. Um, so it's an interesting concept that if you have, and this is something I've heard other people theorize, that if you have groups of humanity go out into space and, and colonize, not even have to be space, but let's say for, for sake of argument space, and they colonize different planets and you have different societies and you leave them alone for a couple centuries and you come back and visit them, they're all going to evolve very differently and some may succeed while others fail and that's kind of the concept they're exploring here that the federation succeeded and humanity blossomed and became this beautiful you know peaceful paradise but then you have these pockets like this one that utterly failed and in fact they be you know they didn't want to join the federation because they wanted to remain in this violent state because that's what they became and i think that's a very interesting concept and honestly i think the tasha's sister aspect of this story kind of detracts from that it becomes the whole point of the episode is not this failed colony or exploring that but hey this is tasha's sister and let's explore that and let's have the crew become attached to her when it's this is a main flaw with this episode that i noticed from watching all the different reviews and different takes on this episode is that it's beyond obvious to any audience member who's not a complete moron that she's deceiving them <laughs> and so to have and that's frustrating to watch to have the crew being like oh you're gonna join starfleet when you know that she's deceiving them it's like it's obvious 
that she's deceiving them and um and to have them like fall for it is kind of frustrating and at the end they do point out the you know oh you know you have to trust and sometimes you're betrayed and whatnot which i like i think that's good but you still they still kind of kind of come off as idiots a little bit just a little bit for falling for it especially since it's so obvious so obvious to the audience that um that she is going to betray them um now the interesting thing i want to talk about is the actress who plays uh a shower yard because i remember having a little crush <laughs> on her when i was when i first saw this episode when i was 12 years old uh i had a little crush on her um and um i saw her in matlock i remember it was after i saw this episode i was like hey you know it's the same with shara yara character um and i i really what i thought of her and i've noticed a lot of other people saying this just now when i watched reviews so i wasn't alone in noticing that she looks very similar to linda hamilton particularly how she was portrayed in the terminator movies which um i believe this episode actually came out before terminator 2 so um yeah it was late 1990 and terminator 2 came out in 91 summer of 91 so it would have been before uh so but she, god yeah she looks so much especially the way linda hamilton appeared in um the first terminator movie because she looks very 80s ish <laughs> and um yeah and that's something that struck me i think i used to imagine her being in a terminator movie <laughs> because she looked a lot and it seems to me that that there was the look they were going for uh in this episode that they were purposely trying to evoke that linda hamilton feel to tasha's sister but the one thing i noticed we're watching this episode just now is she's supposed to be on this like violent chaotic world that is always entrenched and and fighting in fighting and is, and is very chaotic and yet she has all this product in her hair it does like makes her hair like spike up and stay up and 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 <laughs> me wonder like why would these people who live in this kind of society care that much about putting product in their hair i don't know maybe they do prioritize hairstyles <laughs> uh if that guy and this is also pointed out by my sister of how cheesy and 80s ish everyone looks in this episode and like she wasn't the only one to point this out a lot of people point this out because it's very noticeable in fact kind of distracting how 80s ish everyone looks some people incorrectly say 90s -ish. i'm sorry these people don't look 90s ish they look 80s ish <laughs> and, and um, there is a difference and that frustrates me when people don't notice the difference now granted the there's a blurring difference between early 90s and late 80s because you know very similar but there's a difference between 80s and 90s there is and this is they're definitely more 80s looking but anyway um to have her like and this is something i never noticed before either but when she's on the enterprise and she's not wearing her like rebel clothes or her civilian clothes they have her wear this blue cat suit that um immediately made me think of seven of nine like a very very revealing skin type cat suit so now we know that rick berman already had this idea <laughs> before seven of nine came around and it just seems off like now granted she is kind of trying to seduce them like get her get them to trust her so maybe she purposely did that to distract them but mostly she hangs around data who really wouldn't be distracted by such things but she even kisses data on the cheek um but anyway that leads me to yeah that cat suit doesn't make any sense but anyway <laughs> That leads me to my next point there's something i did really like about this episode and that is the portrayal of data as i say i like episodes that portray data more as the more human side of data and how he does have a lot of humanity in him but it's just through his 
you know, emotionless android lens, but there's a lot of, he's not just a robot, and I hate it when people call Data a robot. There's a lot of reviewers to do. He's not a robot. Uh, he's an android, and uh, there is a freaking difference, and he has a lot more humanity in him, that, and that's what makes him an interesting character. Like, he wouldn't be an interesting character at all if he was just a non-feeling robot. It's the fact that, that he is this complex android that has humanity in him that manifests itself in different ways and i think you very clearly see that in this episode and i think they're very clearly trying to say that um data was um sort of attached to ashar he even said that i've become used to her and that his predisposition uh his memory of Tasha, which I believe he really did love her in his own way, which is something, of course, the show didn't establish until after Tasha died. Uh, because really, in the show, when she was still alive, they just had a one-night stand, a drunken one-night stand at that, um, which doesn't really constitute a romance. However, after she passed away, <laughs> they started to explore Data having feelings towards Yar. But anyway, it's clear that because of those feelings it's influencing how he feels about Ashara and that he is becoming attached to her immediately and that she is purposely exploiting that and I think this is actually portrayed quite beautifully at the end when I think this is actually a really strong scene at the end of the episode where um, she's going to you know sabotage the shield and she's going to blow herself up basically in order to allow her cadres to come in and and finally wipe out the well i can't remember the alliance i think they're called and she's a part of the coalition um and i love the way it's played where data is processing the fact that he was betrayed and it's like you were you were lying to us you weren't being honest like you were betraying us and also the way she's reacting she's like none of that matters now just go please like she's pleading with him please save yourself like i think it's making it clear that she really does care about him but she was still prioritizing her loyalty to her group over him but still didn't want him to see him hurt uh but was willing to kill him when she he tried to stop her um but i don't know i didn't like the fact that Riker needed to distract her in order for data to stop her because data supposed to be this very super powerful android with you know faster and lightning uh instincts and movements so i think he should have been able to stop her on his own without Riker's help but you know whatever <laughs> he still managed to stop her um but yeah that was a powerful moment that him he it was almost a human reaction even though he's emotionless he still had that human reaction of being feeling betrayed of feeling deceived it's like you have been deceiving me uh and you could tell he had to process that and i love that and then the scene when he takes her down to the transporter room i also love that scene i thought it was really powerful um where he was like um where she was like you haven't said a word to me he's like it's very casually like in his android way it's like oh what would you like to talk about <laughs> and i think he's not like admitting like to himself because i think he often lies to himself that he's not emotional and not like human but I think he's lying to himself that he's not totally hurt by what she just did and it's obvious that he is and um she you know says it, i wasn't lying like it was real though i did really consider you a friend and you're the only friend i really ever had and it meant a lot to me and he doesn't respond to that. He just tells Chief O'Brien to energize and beam her away. But he has this look. I think the way Brent Spiner played this moment was, was wonderful. Because you could tell through his own android way that he was affected. That he was really affected by what just happened. And um, But he doesn't know what to say, really. So he just tells, her, tells Chief O'Brien to energize and get rid of her. And... Um, 
and then you have that scene which I love. I love that they end the scene with Riker data going to Riker and asking like why am I still thinking about her and and maybe it's better not to trust anyone at all but Riker's like no you have to trust because without trust there's no friendship there's no closeness and and then we see data walk out of the room and he ha- looks at that little um casing of the explosive device that they took out of her and she gave to him it's like here I want you to keep this as a reminder of me and he looked at you can tell like i don't care what anyone says you can tell that that really meant something to him that he was really affected by what had happened to her that i think he did love her and felt betrayed by her and that was and in his own android way and i love that i love that sort of exploration of of his humanity so that's that was really the highlight um of the episode for me um but as i said like the majority of the episode like the set design was another thing that was really not done well it just seemed like generic tunnels which i can't really blame the show i know didn't have a lot of money but still it seems like like there's just one when we first go down there we see the, like the, this neon sign that's kind of like hanging down and i was like ooh, that's very interesting the, you know but i wanted to see more of that like implying that there used to be like this human commercial society that just fell apart but um they didn't really explore that and I, I wish they had. And so the, the set design was actually really generic. And as I said, the costuming is terrible. And the way that one dude was, um, you know, uh, the leader of the alliance, whatever, was, I'm just here to maintain the peace. Like, that was a terrible actor, first of all, may I say. And he was like, oh, you're not going to miss a few of your phasers if you bring them down. Just the way you behaved was so, like, artificial in the 80s ish oh, i'm just trying to keep the peace although i did like the scene where picard like shut him up when he was like at the end of the episode when he they encountered them for you know a shower for betraying them and he's like you have no jurisdiction here and and picard's like okay fine we'll send back a shower and he's like thank you captain i'm just trying to maintain the peace and he's like shut that damn thing off shut him up like that was a good moment <laughs> but um and another interesting thought though is they removed ashar yar's proximity uh detector so she still is a, a strong weapon and that's why i i imagine that's why he wanted her back so badly not because he had any sort of loyalty to her any friendship to her actually gave a shit about her but because she was a strong weapon that that they could use against them and i i imagine that would actually maybe reshape the uh the whole dynamic the power dynamic between the two factions and and i think it's very likely that she dies shortly after by doing these risky missions that surely he's gonna send her in although maybe he would protect her a little bit because she's such a powerful weapon now of not having that proximity detector and that's all the enterprise's fault in fact part of me thought that maybe i was forgetting about a scene where they put it back in her because they realize that they're fucking with the power dynamics in this world but no there's no such scene they just return her to the planet even though she's this powerful weapon now because she can slip by undetected way to honor the prime directive mr pickard anyway (laughs) anyway um so i would like to thank those that support me on patreon it's very much appreciated it does help me continue with my channel and so i'll give a quick shout out to antarius tetzen greg marley francisco chuck hooks kairi 091 anthony d benedictus ricky manigester joel lavals alessandro miguelisio norman buckwald stephen kennedy Britton berg allison fordyce and brandon neil howells thank you also very much for your support so I have a few patron comments on this episode. First comment is from a Norman Buckwald who says, 
I keep recalling when Alyssa called Tasha Yar's sister appearing as if she belonged in Pat Benatar's backup band. Of all the family reunion episodes of season four, yes, I know they will come back with ferocious force in season seven. This is the one I liked the least. <clears throat> I knew we couldn't trust her and had a bit difficulty buying Data's full trust of her. But then again, there are certain borders, subtleties of humanity that are there within Data. Of course, for the planet of rape gangs, that was one aspect we did not see and somewhat, if not dystopian, unruly planet. And I guess important to finally show evidence of planets that are not part of Roddenberry's vision uh, when they are not part of the Federation. I would probably give this episode a 5.5 but since we're supposed to use solid numbers I'll give it a very weak a 6 of 80's hair and trick <laughs> um well I never sort of you know I never sort of said that you guys had to use solid numbers I'm just saying I use solid numbers you guys can do 0.5 or 0.7 or whatever but I just prefer solid numbers but you know if you want to conform to what I do on my channel then sure you can use solid numbers <laughs> um, but yeah it's funny I thought I remember Alyssa saying that she looked like she was in banana or going to a banana rama concert but then that wasn't actually her that was Tasha in like the episode Haven when she had this weird hairstyle <laughs> um, I think it was yeah I think that you're right it was a Pat Benatar's backup band <laughs> Yeah, but no, she did look so 80s in this episode. Anyway, um, yeah, there's a lot of family episodes in, in season four. Um, but as I said, I think it's only it's only the first part of season four. It's only the first stretch of season four. And then season four kind of drops off and doesn't have any. Like, that's the difference between four and seven. The seven has a lot more and sprinkled throughout the entire season like it just doesn't stop whereas season four we got family we got brothers we got suddenly human um legacy and reunion and then after that i think that's it i don't think there's really any um i'm looking at it now no no there's no other family really i mean you can stretch it to say episodes like Identity Crisis because that has LaForge's old friend or maybe Galaxy's Child because they bring back Leah Brahms or um, The Wounded deals with, or Data's Day has um, Chief of Miles O'Brien marrying Keiko and The Wounded has them in, after they got married. I, but I don't know. I wouldn't count any of those. So I think you just have that... that that small stretch of episodes at the start of the season as the family episodes but beyond that it kind of yeah moves past it anyway next comment is from Stephen Kennedy who says I always liked this episode mainly because of the relationship between Data and Ashara Yar Worf folds again in poker I don't completely buy that everyone should have uh, been fooled by Ashara all the human characteristics I would um, I would buy but no Oh, so all the human characters I would buy, but not Worf or Troy. Oh, God, I need to talk about Troy. Uh, I know they needed their help finding the missing crew members that crashed on the planet, but Worf should have been doing his job as head of security, and maybe he did, and Picard shot him down again. Deanna may have been losing her abilities in this episode. Uh, the chip that was removed from Ashara should have been put back in before the Enterprise left. The Coalition would have an advantage over the Alliance now with uh, Ashara having no chip. The scene in Sick Bay when Ashara called her own sister a coward, I think Picard should have realized that these sisters are nothing alike and should have been more cautious. But the episode was going into the last act, and that is why. 
My rating is seven main cast members fooled by Ashara. Wesley wasn't in this episode, and Data, why so cold with Ashara at the end of the episode? You told her things about Tasha that she would have never known, and she did consider you a friend for that reason, you heartless bastard. Out of ten. <laughs> These tangents of something out of 10 is getting out of control i gotta say that was like a whole paragraph of something out of 10 but anyway <laughs> that's fine you do you if you want to keep doing that um but am i mixed up i thought the coalition i thought the alliance was the one that shari yar was in the coalition was the other one am i getting it mixed up are they the coalition and the other one i don't know it doesn't really matter i do like Picard's line about how, oh, it sounds so official, Coalition Alliance, but really they're just a bunch of common street thugs. Um, which I thought was pretty apt. Uh, really interesting. Um, and would describe if there was a so-called libertarian <laughs> paradise, this is exactly what would happen. Anyway. <clears throat> so, yes, I gotta talk about Troy. Um, I, def I forgot to mention that I definitely wanted to get into Troy because this is one of the worst examples of her empath empathic abilities not working. I see they try to skirt this, um, but at the start, like when Ashara and that asshole guy call the ship, and uh, the you know they first say, "Oh, this is Ashara Yar. She was Tasha's sister." Like no one really believes that, but um. After they hang up, Troy is like, oh, or maybe they put him on hold. <laughs> and they ask Troy, and Troy is like, oh, he's obviously deceiving us and wanting to take advantage of us. Like, I can tell that easily. But as to the identity of the young woman, I'm not sure. Wait, how could... How could you not be sure? Like, I, I understand that Deanna doesn't read thoughts, that she more of senses emotions... But she should be able to sense her sincerity when she says she was Tasha's sister. And she should be able to sense the sincerity of the asshole dude as well. So why would... And I don't understand for the plot why they decided she wouldn't know this. Like, why not? It doesn't really help the plot along unless you want to have this tension. Oh, is it really Tasha's sister? Which, first of all, who cares? And secondly, like, of course it is. Like, why would you introduce this character say it's Tasha's sister and it not be? And it's revealed very shortly after that she is. So why would you have Troy not say that she's not sure? Because of course she would be sure. And then later in the episode, when Data says that Ashara wants to join Starfleet, and uh, Picard asks Troy about it, Troy says... I sense a lot of ambiguity in her. She's She may not want to join Starfleet. She's just not sure what she wants to do. Now, this... I could kind of buy this, that because we, we do not learn, and the episode is really trying to tell us that she does have genuine feelings towards Data, that she's not lying when she says she cares about Data, and that, and that the thought of joining the Federation was actually appealing to her. But the fact that she was planning all along to betray the Enterprise crew members, and that she knew that she just wanted to trick them to remove the explosive device or the tracker so that she should could go down and blow up the station and she was willing to die she was going to do a suicide bombing let's be very clear about that and she was so she was not just on the fence she was so devoted that she was willing to kill herself in order to let her cadres defeat the other people and I'm sorry, Troy should have been able to sense that. It doesn't matter if she was conflicted, if she liked Data, if she actually liked Starfleet. It's very clear that she made up her mind, that she knew she was going to betray them and basically kill herself um, in order for her team to win. So no way in fucking hell should Troy not have been able to tell that. Like, that someone is that devoted and that willing that they're willing to give their life for a cause, I'm, what the fuck use are Troy's abilities if she can't tell that? I'm sorry. Like, this is one of the cases where the writers just, like, 
don't know what to do with Troy and they try to be like, oh, she's unsure and their powers seem fucking useless. Because they are. They're useless in this episode. She can't tell someone's about to suicide bomb themselves. She can't tell that she... Anyway, sorry. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Final comment is from Brandon Neil Howells, who says, A Private Little Legacy. This episode, it's title from the fact that it was the 80th episode of Next Generation, which means it had surpassed the original series' run of 79 episodes. Why is Troy playing poker? Shouldn't she be able to read the emotions of the other players? Why, <coughs> excuse me, why does Crusher insist on beaming down? Are her medical staff from the previous episode still lost? Another rescue of hostages held underground. Did anyone else think of Admiral Mark Jamison? I have no idea what the Alliance and the Coalition are even fighting about. I'm not even sure they know either. I didn't know that Lyndall Hamilton from the first two Terminator films was Tashi Har's sister. And which do I laugh at first? The Leather Jacket Gang or Beth uh, Torsen's hairstyle, which put me in the mind of Vosh? Why do the crew of the Enterprise automatically ascribe the same qualities to a shower that Tasha had? That's just stupid. My brother and I are not alike in character or looks. Data has such a crush on Ashara and it seems very silly to me. Of course Ashara is going to betray the Enterprise crew. And what the hell is it with Ashara Yar's blue jumpsuit? All I can think of was Seven of Nine a remarkably similar brown outfit in Voyager. I want to know what will happen to Ashara without her proximity detector. Four broken-hearted androids out of ten. Um, yeah, Mark Jameson. I did think of that. It did remind me of uh, Too Short a Seasons with the, the bad set of the tunnels. Um, what else have we got here? Troy playing poker. I, her empathic abilities apparently are fucking useless according to this episode, so I, I think her playing poker makes the perfect sense. <laughs> But it's but she plays poker all the time and they never bring that up. And by the way, I didn't talk about how this is I believe only the fourth time they showed him playing poker. I think it was two times in season two, uh Measure the Man and uh the Emissary. One time in season three, Allegiance. I think that's the only time in season three, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I'm forgetting about something, but I think Allegiance was the only time in season three. And then this is the first time in season four. So it hasn't been that much. Um, and it is interesting to see the evolution of Data because when he played poker for the first time, Measure of Man, he was like, time to pluck a pigeon. <laughs> you know, Brian said. It's funny, that was the only time O'Brien played poker. He never came back to the table. Not cool enough, I guess, anymore. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so he was seen as a dope who was easy to defeat, but it seems like he studied the game and learned how to play, because in this episode, Riker's like, I've never seen a better poker face. Which actually makes a lot of sense for an android. Like, who would, <coughs> who would have a better poker face than an android who <laughs> doesn't feel emotions? It seems like that would be a perfect fit. Uh, and then, so you have Data who could easily stack the deck with his android abilities, and he can easily track the cards, so he could count cards or keep track of cards so easily. You have LaForge who in a later episode in season 5 admits to cheating because he could see through the cards that Worf bought. And then you have Troy who could sense people's emotions who would be able to tell uh, whether or not they're cheating so uh, whether or not they're bluffing I should say and therefore Riker should lose every time. Uh, but of course Worf does fold, as Stephen likes to point out, Worf does fold pretty much every time, which is contradictory to the Emissary, where he was seen as the Iceman, who was really awesome, but every time after that episode, he seems to suck at poker. <laughs> he folds every time. And that tracks, because everyone else is cheating! Except for Riker, who apparently is just really good at poker. And that whole thing with him doing that card trick with data that I, I thought that was kind of dumb <laughs> i didn't really like that but a lot of people did point out that this poker scene actually did have relevance to the rest of the episode because it was about 
bluffing. It was about being deceived, uh, which, and particularly when it comes to data, which comes up later on. So that aspect of it was at least good. Um, yes, what is up with her hairstyle? Beth Torresant, if that's how you say the actress name. Uh, yeah, that hairstyle is crazy. But anyway, I looked up her her IMDb and apparently she stopped doing movies and television in 2006 and it said in her bio simply that she got married and had a child so maybe she just had a family life and just gave up acting which makes sense but I, her first credit um, on her IMDb was being in a Bon Jovi video and from 1984. I didn't even realize Bon Jovi were around in 1984. I thought they first formed in 87 when they did the, you know, the you give love a bad name bullshit. But apparently they were around before that and they had this video that I, I watched it that she was in and goddamn, so 80s. <laughs> so 80s like i can't see her and she's been as i said she was in matlock i remember seeing her in matlock and she was in um macgyver and uh, a few other things she was actually in babylon 5 um she played um captain sheridan's wife and when i read that i'm like no it wasn't that wasn't her they got bruce boxletter's actual wife to play captain sheridan's wife in babylon 5 but then when i looked it up Apparently, there was a brief scene where she played um, Captain Sheridan's wife in early season two, but in later season two, when they brought back his wife for a more prominent role, they recast her because apparently um, Beth Torsant wasn't available for that, so they recast her and got um, Bruce uh, Boxletter, if that's his name, the dude who plays Captain Sheridan, they got his actual wife to come in and play. But anyway, that's Babylon 5. Um, <laughs> and I think she was in something else I recognized. But anyway, <clears throat> um, what else? Um, why does Crusher insist on beaming down or her medical staff from the previous episode still lost? I'm kind of going to defend her here because Worf is being a little sexist here. And I think that's the point of this scene that he was like, oh, this place isn't safe for women. And of course, Crusher's going to be like, fuck off. <laughs> and I do get the impression that that Crusher has... Um, and by the way, Worf's sexism will come back later on. Uh, this becomes, I think it's the episode The Outcast, if I'm not too mistaken. But anyway, and that kind of goes along with the Klingons being a little sexist. But anyway, um, yeah, like she's the chief medical officer. Why wouldn't she beam down to the planet? I totally back her for... Why would she... Like, they never send down her staff. Why would they change it now? Are you saying it needs to be a male staff member? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. Because I, I, I actually kind of liked that scene. I liked how the fact that she was like, Worf, I can handle myself. And Riker's like, nah, she's coming. I think, War, to be fair to Worf... Maybe he wasn't mean sex. Maybe he just was opposing any medical officer coming because they weren't a trade security because they were going into a dangerous situation, to be fair. But, I mean, Beverly's fought off the Borg before, so these pesky little 80s rats <laughs> with the 80s hair going to a Pat Benatar concert, nothing compared to that. But anyway... <laughs> but anyway... Um, so, yeah, why, uh, so several people brought up why the Enterprise crew trusted her so much. I kind of buy that, and I kind of don't, like, I, I think they, I buy that they wanted to see Tasha in her. Like, I can buy that, but they, I think they trusted her, still did trust her too easily. But if you noticed, to defend them a bit. They didn't trust her until after, like, they beamed down, first of all, and she, like, almost died trying to protect them. And so she kind of earned their trust by doing that. You had that scene with Riker beaming back, holding her, that, you know, which I think... And they all started to trust her a hell of a lot more after that. So that kind of tracks for me, although I still think maybe they're being a bit dumb. 
But I do like the fact that Data was deceived. I like the portrayal of him being human like that. I, I, I think that's great, personally. So anyway, thank you, patrons, very much for your comments. So my rating for a Legacy out of 10 uh, is going to be a 7. Very good. And I was teetering between a 6 and a 7 for this episode, and I very nearly gave it a 6, but then as I was talking through the data aspect of it, like the end of the episode, what they did with data and the scenes with him and Ashara saying goodbye and how he was obviously very hurt. I like that. I, I love episodes that betrayed sort of the human side of data. So that pushes this episode up to a seven uh, for me, but it's a weak seven. It's definitely not one of the better episodes. I stand by my statement that it's a mediocre episode <laughs> in season four. Anyway, uh, that is it for my review of legacy so let me just bring up the schedule here of what's coming up next on my channel uh next monday will be my top 10 star trek voyager episode soundtracks where i rate uh or rank of the uh, voyager soundtracks the score for each episode of my favorite ones uh, and then Wednesday, uh, we'll continue on with TNG Season 4 with my review for Reunion. And then uh, Thursday, be over on Patreon for the Patreon supporters uh, with my Revisited for Future Imperfect. And then on Saturday, back on my main channel with another new review for Final Mission. So that's what's coming up on my channel. Be sure to check that out and uh, check out my channel for more Star Trek reviews and more uh, videos and many other shows as well. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching. <laughs>